Good evening, members. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our latest online event here at the Wine Society. Uh, this evening, we will be celebrating one of the world's most iconic grape varieties, and that is Pinot Noir. The reason for tonight's event, if ever we needed a reason to celebrate a grape variety as iconic as Pinot Noir, is that it coincides with International Pinot Noir Day, which takes place this weekend. So we're either uh, a little early, or indeed maybe we're starting now and we'll continue on for the rest of the weekend. The choice is up to us, I suppose, uh, as, as consumers and lovers of the grape variety and of wine in general. Uh, my name's Gil. I'm one of the events managers at the Wine Society. And tonight I'm joined by my colleague and fellow events manager, Emma Briffitt. Emma, good evening to you. Waving away there. <laughs> uh, how are you? Hello. <laughs> you well? I'm good. How are you? I'm excited. I've got Very... six glasses of Pinot in front of me, so um, yes. life is good. <laughs> <laughs> Friday evening and six glasses of Pinot. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yes. So, uh, members, as, as we said there, this is a celebration. Tonight's event of just over an hour or so celebrating this iconic, this venerable great variety of Pinot Noir, designed to be a fairly relaxed, um, moderately informal um, sort of event there. Certainly some educational elements to tonight. Um but to help us with um, the conviviality of tonight's event, we've created a tasting pack, um, as, as Emma alluded to there, a tasting pack featuring six different Pinot Noir, all 100%. There's no blends this evening, all red wines as well. Uh, not just from six different producers, but we have six different countries on show this evening. So three from Europe and three from outside of Europe. My hope is that these wines have some similar traits. They are all Pinot Noir after all, so there should be, should be some similarities but that they all speak of their, their place. They're all individual uh, and their unique characteristics. Because Emma, as you know, Pinot Noir is one of those great varieties that, that does very much speak of where it's grown, speaks of its vintage, speaks of the soils and the vineyard and the yeah. winemaking techniques. So my hope is that we've structured this in the right order. Um, and what we'll do, members, is we'll uh, take it in turns, Emma and myself, just to, to introduce each of these six wines, talk a bit about them, share where they're from, a little bit about the producer, about the region, um, and of course about the wines and how they taste. Um, perhaps many of you have some of these wines, maybe some of you have bought these packs yourselves to taste along with us. Maybe you've bought one or more of these bottles to, to open tonight and enjoy and enjoy through the rest of the weekend. Or perhaps even you've poured a, a wine of your own from your wine cellars or your wine racks. However you're enjoying tonight's tasting, we'd love to know where you're joining us from. If you have a glass, what's in your glass? I have wine one in front of me here. Uh, currently, I'm going to try and pour as I go any of the one glass, <laughs> so I'm going to try and pour out of the packs. But we'd love to hear from you, members. I can see a number of you are already um, popping some messages into the chat where you're coming from, uh, where you're joining us from, and what you have in your glass. We love to interact with you in that way uh, here on Zoom. So do please give us any of your comments and thoughts throughout the evening in the chat feature. If you have any questions for Emma and I, and we do have one or two questions that have already been submitted to us earlier on. Um, please put that into the Q&A um, tab. That way we can see that front and centre. It doesn't get potentially missed or lost in the mm -hmm. chat, and we'll do our very best to answer those questions. Uh, some of them I may well um, just ask you, Emma, if I don't have the answers. <laughs> uh, vice versa. Um, but Emma, you're going to speak first about the very first wine. I am. Well, I've got the the job of, um, job of the Mirage. The um, job of the Mirage, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but before, it's a nice job to have. <laughs> yes. But um, before we do jump in with the first one, I wondered if we could do a little bit of a, an origin story of Pinot Noir. So, mm. uh, a little bit of background about this great variety, why it has its own individual international day of, of, of recognition. Um, and, and Pinot Noir is a, a very ancient great variety, one of those varieties that, that absolutely is just and fits that, that descriptor. We are looking at a variety that was cultivated in Roman times, most likely pre-Roman, I believe. Uh, or certainly there's a strong, strong indication belief that it may be pre-Roman. So at least 2,000, 2,000 plus years of age, this particular varietal. Um, there's also, I read, a, quite a strong, um, widely held belief that Pinot Noir is closely related to the, the wild indigenous uh, grapevines, the Vitus Silvestris, I think it's called, um, of Eurasia, you know, maybe mm -hmm. first, second, third generation removed. So it's got some pedigree behind it. Um, and perhaps with that, no surprise that there are many great varieties um, that call Pinot Noir its parent or one of its parent, uh, parent um, grapes. 
we could be here for another five, 10 minutes describing all of them, or certainly those that I've been reading up on. But there are three particular wines, that uh, grape varieties rather, that the parent of is, is Pinot. Chardonnay, Aligote, uh, and Gamay are, are three that immediately spring to mind. Do you know of any others? I'll put you on the spot. You have put me on the spot. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I, not that I didn't think of. <laughs> interestingly, that, that was very cruel of me. Um, interestingly, though, as well, there's there's potential um, or research being done, and maybe some some um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Some some sort of evidence. That's the word I'm looking for. That it's also a grandparent of some of the northern Italian black grape varieties, Teraldigo mm. and Lagrain as well, uh, and maybe even a little connection with the likes of Syrah, um, two or three times. Yeah. It's a fascinating. It's one of those variety. great varieties that, if you read Jancis Robinson's kind of history of um of wine mm. grapes, it comes up everywhere. It really yeah. does, which yeah. is why it's so hard to pin down. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so a, a variety that that uh, has huge history and is responsible for many of the world's finest um, or great great varieties, most well known, most loved great varieties, not just in its own right, but many others. Um, as a varietal as well, I think it was first um, it was first mentioned a written record of the more modern Pinot Noir name was in 1375. It's a native of of Burgundy, um, and it was the Duke of Burgundy in 1375, I believe, who wrote that um, some some Pinot Noir, I presume, in barrel was to be sent to to Bruges in Belgium as part of a dis uh, diplomacy mission. Um, so not only was that the first recorded, you no, know, 650 years or so ago. Um, but also it shows and indicates that the quality that was being produced and that sort of renown, even at that stage, that this was a wine that is befitting a diplomacy mission. Um, and it's just gone from strength to strength, I think, from that moment on. Yeah. As a variety. Um, but it's also quite a fiddly grape. It's not a, an easy grape to cultivate. It's not an easy grape to grow. It's very particular on what it likes and what it dislikes. Um, it's a, a, an early budding grape variety, I believe. So... Susceptible to spring frosts, the the site, the vineyard selection has to be incredibly um, carefully managed or carefully decided, um, where it mitigates against that risk of spring frost. Otherwise, it's a very costly um, endeavour to try and to mitigate against spring frost that might be impending, or indeed if you do fall uh, fall foul and victim to it. It's also an early ripening grape variety as well, so it does work very nicely in in cooler climates. In fact, it's a variety that prefers cooler climates. Um, it can work with more moderate. Um, but it very much um, disagrees with hot and warm climates. It's very thin-skinned grapes. Members, if you're familiar with the variety, it very rarely gets the colour in the in the wine that you would say with, with Cabernet Sauvignon or, or Syrah, these more thicker-skinned grapes, um, because, of course, the colour of the wine comes directly from the, the pigments in the skin. But that can cause it to create some sunburn. It can shrivel. So it doesn't really like hot weather at all. It likes quite high uh, acid sort of alkaline soils as well, limestone, clay, chalks. Uh, so it is a very fiddly grape variety. It's a very difficult grape variety. Um, but when it's done right, it's one of the finest and produces some of the finest wines and most expensive wines and highly sought after wines on the planet. Absolutely. It's called the heartbreaker grape because the so many people try to do it and so many people just can't get it right. It's the kind of, um, seems to be the one grape variety that most winemakers just dream of making a really good example of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we have six wines in front of us where the winemakers have done very good jobs and they keep producing exceptional vintages of this grape. And we're going to cover those a bit now, I think. Um, Certainly are. With our, our very first wine of the evening. So over to you. And oh, thank you. Um, so we've got for wine number one, we've got the Domaine Nicolas Perrault. Um, it's their Morange Premier Cru and it's the Clos de Roi. Um, it's 2021 and one of the questions that has come up is um, what's the difference because there are three of them um, on our website at the moment they in terms of what's the difference between the three well Melanie's got the Le Clos um, so she might be able to tell us how she finds that one in comparison um, but they're just slightly varying levels of um, of intensity and of um, fruit, fruit profile, fruit flavors. So this one, I think, what do you think, Gil? I think it kind of sits in the middle. The other, um, the other one, the Mirage Le Loya is um, a little bit more silky. And then the, um, the, the other one is, tends to be a little bit more robust 
in style, yeah. but you let me know what you think. Um, so a little bit about this wine then. Um, it's made by Nicola, Nicola Perot. Um, he used to work in Santenay. Um, but he came back to the family winery when his father retired in 2011. Um, Morange is uh, the southernmost um, village of the uh, Côte de Rhone Appalachians. And um, as of 2018, the area under production for reds was 177 hectares. So it's not a huge area. They do produce a tiny amount of white, um, 15, 15 and a half hectares of white in total. Um, but the Appalachian does have seven premier crews. Um, and if you're growing within the defined area, you can also, of course, claim the Appalachian um, Cote de Bain Village as well. Um, it's one of the areas that is... Um, Kind of Toby describes it as really upcoming. It's one to watch. Um, so it's benefited from climate change. Um, everything's got a little bit warmer. And um, that little bit of that slight rise in temperature that you have in that particular area of the coke bone is just enough to kind of push the pinot just over the, um, the ripening edge. And um, quality's on the up for sure in this area. So if you love Burgundy and you don't love the prices of um, some of the kind of more, more famous names, um, then this is definitely one, one to go for, I think. Um, having tasted it, I haven't actually tasted it. I've just smelt it. I've just been sat <laughs> sniffing it while you've been talking, but um, it does have, it does have lovely nose. red fruit to it, doesn't it? And the kind of violets and that little bit of kind of warming spice there as well absolutely yeah i've just popped up on the on the screen I thank you, you for that as well members yeah my um, um my classy highlighting so that you can immediately see where mirage is um as you can <laughs> see it's right down in the south of the coat de bone it is the southernmost i believe as well is that of, of the coat de bone for sure yeah yeah um, it is an incredibly good one i'm slightly nervous that we've we've started so strongly <laughs> five more five more to go um, i don't know the is... germans got a lot of there's a lot of people on the chat who are saying that the germans is one of their favorites and oh, you know terrific. i don't want to jump onto the german too early but i have to agree <laughs> with them i think it's lovely yeah. i do agree but this I is a lovely agree. it has a beautiful perfume but it's exactly as you described there is a wonderful warming spice um, mm. throughout on the nose and it continues on the palate. Lovely grip. It's got some very ripe, firm tannins. But with Pinot Noir, we're never talking, you know, really full, robust tannic structure that, you, again, you would have in the likes of, say, Cabernets and and, and Syrahs. Mm. But there's definite grip. There's a wonderful structure there in that wine. Beautiful acidity, quite high acidity. Um, yeah. A wine that that definitely shows signs of, of ageability. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah, touch of cranberry. I um, We've been picking um, brambles from the hedgerows and um, it has a touch of that kind of bramble kind of flavour yeah. to it as well. There's something ever so slightly wild about it that um, <laughs> it's just yeah. really lovely. And then it's quite perfumed, quite floral as well. So it's a really nice one. But there's there's that, as you say, there's something wild about it, but it's it's controlled it's balanced it's not wild in in terms of an unbalanced or an edginess to the wine mm. it's not sharp mm -hmm. it's not got those sort of rough edges at all um yeah very very good one um just a quick one for paul um no you didn't need to open the mm. sachets beforehand gil and i do because um i don't get on particularly well with balancing the scissors and the box and then pouring into a glass with everybody watching it tends to go everywhere so I'd rather do it in private um <laughs> it just means I'm organized and ready to go but no you can pour as you go whatever works for you completely so in terms of the comparison um if Melanie does if Melanie is trying the um the Le Clos, um and wants to tell us how that's comparing, what she kind of her tasting note for that. Please do, Melanie, but don't want to put you on the spot either. So um, <laughs> there we have it. I so, think as well, yeah. Morange, again, I haven't got a, I haven't 
sadly tasted these three different expressions from Nicolas Perrault together. I'd love that. Maybe that's something I'll do on Monday. Um, but um, I, I believe that sort of the appellation of Morange sort of fits over three different villages in the south there, and and, and each. Premier Cru, there aren't any Grand Cru sites there, but Premier Cru very much is the is the top. And Nawai, I believe, is in a different village to the wine we're tasting. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, we're talking neighbours. Um, they are they're, very, very much neighbours, right next to each other. Yeah. But I mean, the whole beauty of um, of Burgundy is that you can be literally a couple of metres away, and the soil aspect will change slightly, and also the soil type will change slightly, and Pinot is, as you said before, is such a mirror of the soil and the kind of the just general terroir in in all that it will completely change the flavors that you get and the the structure, especially yeah. of the wine. Um, given the warm weather, have we uh, did you chill your wines at all? Actually, I had mine. Uh, I didn't chill my wines. No, I had them at room. Well, they're at room temperature. They've been in one of the cooler rooms of the house, mm -hmm. um, but by no means. Yeah, no means chilled down, absolutely not. But uh, if you have chilled the wine down, it is something absolutely that you can do and, and can do with Pinot. And it, it could very well bring out a little bit more of that fresh fruit character um, and yeah. the crispness. But uh, if you have done that, do let us know. But no, I, I have it myself. Have you? No, I'm not that organised. <laughs> I probably should have done. The Morange, I think, could have been a couple of degrees cooler, actually. But um, it's very much a case of... Um, personal taste I think with with chilling as well okay so I'm looking around and I can't see Gil there Gil are you still around or have you have you disappeared on me I think might have lost Gil um Nicola, I'd forgot I'd left mine in the fridge, so I didn't get them out. 30 minutes, though. I mean, it's in this hot weather, 30 minutes, that does, it can warm up so quickly. We have this problem with tastings generally where it doesn't take long to for the temperatures to go up and down with the wine. So, um, yeah, it can make quite a difference. Um, so in terms of, Peter's asking, in terms of which of the wines would age well and how they will change, the Morange is delicious now but you definitely could keep it for longer if you wanted to um I mean I would be I kind of over the next five years for me and as it develops you tend to get less of that red fruit flavor and more of the kind of the earthy the sous-bois um, the French call it the kind of slight nade mouth um, kind of characteristics coming through. So it starts to get slightly more farmyardy. Um, and so kind of slightly less of the fruit, more of the farmyard. So it depends whether you, I mean, I think it's really nice now, but I do think also, as I have a habit of doing, if it went into the rack and I forgot about it for a couple of years, I think it would also be absolutely fine. And it would be interesting to see how it changed as well. Um, right. Uh, I've been, I have a no bon climat in the fridge. This keeping it there for days on end damage the wine. Only if it's days on end. Um, ABC is, I believe that wine's under cork. So you've got to be slightly careful with how long you keep a wine under cork in the fridge because the constant cold temperature um, can harden the cork and cause it to fail. Um, so it's not great to keep it in there kind of for months and months on end. But if you're just popping it in there, you know, and if it's just been in there for a week or something like that, then it'll be absolutely fine. It won't be a problem at all. Um, so we've got to I think it's time to move on to the next wine. But I am going to try and find out where Gil has gone. Um, seems to have disappeared on me and the next wine is his wine so what we might do if it's okay by you guys is um whilst I wait for him to come back might talk to you a little bit about wine number three the Danbury Ridge um 
which is um, my next wine to talk about. And then hopefully by the time I finish talking about that, Gil will be back again. Um, give me one second. There we go. Just trying to find out where he's gone. So if everybody is happy to skip the, the Spade Burgunder, which is one of my favourites, so I'll be looking forward to coming back to that. Oh, it looks like... Oh, I've got you back. Hello. <laughs> I don't know where you went, but Sorry, I was getting Emma. a bit concerned that I was doing the rest of the event on my own. <laughs> my, my apologies to you and to you members. The, the laptop had other plans and decided to... to... <laughs> Unexpectedly, uh, sign me, sign me off. <laughs> um, well, where were we? Sorry, where are we? We're where all are fine. Do you want me to? Um, do you want me to talk about the Danbury Ridge while you um, while you get yourself sorted, or are you happy to go in and talk about the Spätburgunder? <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to talk about the Spätburgunder. I can do Which that case, now. You do yes, that, and then absolutely. I can talk because I love the Spätburgunder. It's gorgeous oh. wine. Um, oh, question. Was 2021 a good year? In in Burgundy or in Germany? Gen generally, Colin was asking, and I know kind of in some places it was, but I'm not sure whether kind of generally. Oh, in Burgundy. In Burgundy, great. So in Burgundy, I think 21 was, I'm just trying to think, I think it was a very small crop, if I remember rightly. I'll have to, I'll have to, um, check in with with Toby on that but I think 21 and indeed 22 I think very good quality but much lower yields um, mm -hmm. which is never the thing we want to hear anywhere but especially in somewhere like Burgundy where um, the interest far far surpasses the quantity already produced in an, in an average year um, but it did result in you know, very good quality wines great concentration and power and in in, in structure in the in the grapes in the juice but just less of it okay perfect You've yeah. done your you've done your job now. You can talk about the straight big on there. <laughs> well, bear with me a moment, actually. There. So, have you got it in your glass? I have. I have. Yeah. I've poured all mine because of um, I didn't have the um, the knowledge to just remove the packet altogether from the cardboard box, which is um, what was advised. I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to do that next time. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, so yes, let's let's look at our, our uh, German wine. There, members, if you have the Spätburgunder, Martin Vassmer, Mark Graffelad uh, wine in your glass, we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I'm just getting some of my notes back up. Well, I'll do this so, without my. While notes you're up. doing that, um, Melanie hasn't had a chance to taste the wine yet because she's putting some food together. But um, oh, yeah. she's saying good good to get some advice on opening, breathing food and wine matching. Um, so in terms of opening, trying to think, Toby always says don't decant Pinot because it is so perfumed um, mm. and so fragrant. If you decant it, you're kind of, you're in risk of, the oxygen is at risk of taking away some of that kind of, that initial perfume and that initial fragrance. So my my advice always with things like burgundy is open pour into your glass sniff as soon as you've poured and just kind of register and then leave it for 10 minutes or so and go back to it and then just keep coming back to it but mm. what do you think girl no I, I agree it's not it's not a variety that I tend to uh, decant uh, it's not a variety that that I tend to have older vintages of all that often either. Mm -hmm. um, not that not that I do that with other grapes either. Let me just put that put that out there. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, none of the wines that we're looking at this evening are, are old either. I think all sort of twenty one and twenty vintages, perhaps even some twenty two. But no, I agree. It's it's a very perfumed, very aromatic, wonderfully um, uh, evocative sort of grape variety in that respect. So I would I wouldn't necessarily decant these wines, um, mm. not at all. No. Um, and in terms of serving kind of tend to be on the cooler side so I think Toby always says to remember we did that Pinot workshop was it about 15 mm. degrees 15 so, degrees yeah 15 ideally, degrees 15. Yeah. um and then in terms of food now it's it's basically you're just looking at balance and weight so um anything 
it is personal, which is why I'm hesitating slightly. Um, so somebody say Nick is saying he's got his with salmon and hard cheeses. I love it yeah. with um, soft cheese as well. So I love yeah. Pinot and um, the kind of bloomy rind cheeses like Breeze and things like that. But then I know would, you know, I find it, it works for me, but I know other people find it tastes quite ammonia -y with um with brie. Um otherwise if you're a meat eater, things like lamb, um, yeah. which is quite a fragrant meat, and um kind of turkey and things like that would um would yeah. work really well. How about what do you think? Oh mushrooms. I I, well <laughs> see that was absolutely that was going to be mine. I tend to lean towards those earthier style um you know dishes or, or those that maybe as you say, mushrooms is, is typically a go-to for me. Aubergine, I quite like it, aubergine in there, especially if it's kind of burnt or slightly toasted charred aubergine, um, just to get that lovely kind of smoky, earthy character coming through that. Um, from a meat perspective, I always quite enjoy it with with uh, duck, with guinea fowl, those sorts of meats as well. Um, but there's such a variation of, of style. You know, some of the wines that we'll taste tonight have much more power and much more body to them than than others that really... Um, it comes down to the, the 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 wine, the individual wine, as much as the great variety itself. There's a huge, a huge scope. Mm. Yeah, and it's fun just to experiment. Try it, try it with with different different dishes. You know, experiment there against cut against the uh, the normal kind of perceived uh, you know facts and rules. That's what I yeah. always like to do. So Peter's saying he finds the Schweifberg under a little bit rustic, which I think is your cue. Yeah. To um to yeah. give us the lowdown on um <laughs> uh, yeah I'd agree with that um yeah hopefully in a in a in a good way rustic um <laughs> but yeah so Spätburgunder here we've we've quite literally just hopped across the uh, France's eastern borders with Germany we are in um, the region of Baden um which is uh, Germany's third largest wine producing region. Um, we do have a slide somewhere although I'm I won't lie to you that has. I need to bring that back up, um, but it is the the most southerly or one of the most sort of southern southwesterly areas wine producing regions of Germany. It hugs that that border with France, um, and it's over on the eastern flank of the the Rhine River. So it sort of faces um, not just Alsace in France, but also faces the the Vosges Mountains. And the Vosges Mountains, like in in Alsace, act as a rain shadow. So this region is is known for being the warmest, the driest, and one of well, sorry, the warmest and the sunniest. And I believe one of the the uh, one of the driest regions of Germany as well. Um, and and Burgundian grape varieties, so not just Pinot Noir, or in this case Spät Burgunder, or sort of late Pinot, or late Burgundy, or late Burgunder, in its literal translation. Um, but I believe that Burgundian varietals make up about sixty two percent of all plantings here in Baden. Um, and it is a region that is growing in its popularity, not just in the UK but outside as well. Um, for its high quality wines uh, and really led by Pinot Noir. So it was a varietal, it was a wine rather, that when putting the, the taste and pack together, we had to show a wine from Germany, in my view. Um, there were many places that we weren't able to do. Members, my apologies if some of your favourite um, Pinot producing regions haven't featured in the in the six and the tasting pack, but we had to get it down to six. <laughs> um, but I just, I think it's a fantastic wine, quite different to the previous. Again, with that rusticity, yes, I think there's a little bit more um, a, a freshness um, to the wine. Not that the first wasn't fresh, but the first had a bit more of a, a structure, I think, on here. Here, there's a little bit more spice. The acidity feels a little higher, perhaps, as well. It's got a little bit more edge to it. Um, and it comes from a sub-region called Mark Graffordland, which is the most southerly point of Baden. Um, they quite literally, in terms of the vineyard sites, they have uh, the Rhine off to their eastern flank. They have the Black Mountains, the Black Forest, rather, to their to their west uh, sorry the other way around <laughs> um and it's a it's an area there that viticulture has been in this region since the 12 you know 1298 the first mention of pinot noir in this region or certainly in germany as Spreeburgunder was in the 1400s 1450s i think it is um so it's a varietal that's been in this region for a very long time viticulture has been in this region for a very long time um and this particular producer martin vasma um is is one of multi-generation investments that have grown up in the town of um, Schlatt, which is a town in this area of, of uh, Mark Graffordland, uh, Graffordland, easy for me to say. Um, 
and they've always they've always had their hand in winemaking. They've always been producing, growing grapes, making wine in some degree or another. The majority of the family across the generations. But I think it wasn't until 1997 that they started producing their own wines under their own label. So in that respect, relatively recent. Um, and in 2006, I think they got a. Um, an upgrade in the cellars and the winemaking facilities as well. So they really specialize in, in Burgundian in Burgundian grape varieties, Spray Burgunder or Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot, uh, Pinot Blanc as well as Chardonnay and other varieties. Um, but this particular wine um, sees natural yeasts. So it's it's naturally fermented uh, with natural yeasts rather than uh, inoculated yeasts. Um, and it's a very slow, very long, gradual fermentation process um it sees roughly 18 months in in burgundian barriques as well so it is it's not a wine trying to be burgundy but they've they've very much sort of taken their um i suppose a, a mark of respect towards burgundy and taking their their, their inspiration from um but a wine very unique uh, and a wine of its own style i think here uh, and i thought i mentioned or someone in chat there i remember i like the touch of earthiness on the nose very much agree mm. very much agree yeah and and again there we just had another uh, message come through there really good value that was another point i was going to make uh, on this particular wine um terrific value which isn't something we tend to be able to say for pinot noir as we mentioned a great variety as tricky as it is it's um it's not an easy grape to put together not an easy grape to cultivate and to and to produce great quality wine so we very rarely find wines of true great value but I think this wine definitely definitely ticks that box. Am I right? Thinking it's it's just over the fifteen pounds a bottle mark. I think it is now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah fifteen pounds fifty. Fifteen fifty. Wonderful. Forgive me there. I just took a sip as I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a nice comparison between the two. There on the finish. There, there's a lovely elegance. It's precision. There's a focus and an energy on that wine. Um, lots of acidity. You know, it's incredibly clean. Mm. Um, and, and if you can't tell, I mean, so the Nicholas Perot is um, twenty six fifty. So it's mm -hmm. almost for half the price. Yeah. You could have yeah. two bottles of that for the price of the Mirage. If that's your if that's your bag. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but no, a, a lovely wine. It's a firm favourite, I think, well, certainly of mine, but I think a firm favourite of us in the tastings department. Mm. Um, it's a wine we love We love to show, we love to talk about. Um, and Germany, in terms of Pinot Noir, is a country that's really on the on the upward trajectory. There are many. It's not alone mm -hmm. in this. But in terms of the production of high-quality Pinot that's age-worthy as well, we talk about age-worthiness uh, as we did in, with Burgundy, P uh, Germany is a country to watch out and to look for and to seek the wines from, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so can we display the notes and the price as well? I think you've um you've got the that information, haven't you, on um the presentation? I do indeed. Just bear with me, everyone. I'll bring that up. Are the wine society going to stock more German Pinots? That's a really good question. I think because we've got a change in buyers for Germany. So Mast will be leaving at the end of the year, Fiona's taking over. Um, I think you'll see a little bit of movement in the German range. Um, I think you'll see that with all the, the new buyers that are taking over as they kind of stamp their authority on their range. So um, hopefully, and I think also as the German Pinots get better and better, I think we'll see mm. more and more of them on the on the list as well. Yeah, so let me just bring, let me know when you can see that, Emma. Yep, all good. Excellent. So there's no, yeah, the price actually isn't on here, but uh, it is 15.50, um, I believe you said there. But Yeah, sorry, I missed the price off. I think that's just wishful thinking from my part. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as we, as, as it says here, you know, this is an area that's um, become known or becoming known as the German Tuscany. You know, it's very warm summers here, the rolling hills, the undulating countryside, um, and a winemaking history that goes almost as far back, as I said there, back into certainly 1298, uh, if not earlier. Um, we do have a picture as well as we have it on screen. Yeah, so a fairly busy um, map of Germany, um, but I don't know if you can see my cursor 
uh, members, but this long yellow. orangey yellow section like down there. <laughs> Yes. Um, in the southwest, that's that's the area of Baden, and the particular region that we're looking at is right down here on the, on the southernmost tip of that uh, of that region, so just on the borders of, of France. Mm. Um, but yes, a wonderful wine, um, thrilled to include it in this lineup. Yeah, it is lovely. And talking of wonderful wines, <laughs> so that yes. way into my next one. <laughs> you know, you were talking about the the upcoming kind of regions that are just doing really well for Pinot at the moment. So wine number three is the Danbury Ridge from Essex. Um, it's 2021. And I think this is a beautiful wine. Mm. It's um, it's not a cheap wine, but, you know, in, again, comparing it to Burgundy, um and now that I've realized I haven't put the prices on I will tell you that it is 37 pounds a bottle um but I think it's I think it's just a really lovely wine so Danbury Ridge was founded by two generations of the Bunker family. So it's Michael and Heather Bunker and then their daughters, Janine and Sophie. Um, the first vines were planted in 2014. They had a very much a focus on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So Danbury is, um, it's located southeast of the village of Danbury in Essex. Now this, that little pink ready scribble is where I'm guessing that it, yeah. more or less is I could be slightly wrong but I did view quite a few ordinance survey maps to try and get <laughs> the exact point um so it's um, a unique geological feature known as the Danbury to Tip Tree Ridge um and it's equidistant between the um, Blackwater Estuary to the north and the River Crouch to the south so they had a farm already, which is really useful. Um, and um, it turned out that some of the um, some of the fields that they had, the farmers, the local farmers had just gone, this, this land is rubbish. It's only good for training racehorses over wet winters. Um, so they weren't using it for um, for summer cereal crops. And um, because of that, they thought, well, actually, it's not fair fun enough for the crops, but it would probably work really well for, for Pinot and Chardonnay. Um, so in terms of 2021, it was a tale of two halves. So very cool start to the growing season. They had spring frosts, um, but this is OK because they had particularly low yields and um, they say extremely vigilant vineyard management. So I have a feeling they were kind of working hard in the vineyards mm. to just keep everything under control. Um, but then they had a really, really warm September and October. Because they had kind of such a cool start, the sugar levels were lower than you might expect. Um, but the phenolic ripeness and flavor profiles are really good. So you've got this lovely balance between the acidity and the, the sugar in the wine. Um, it was hand-picked, it was de-stemmed about crushing, so whole berries used, um, and then open top oak and concrete fermenters, three to five day cold soak before fermentation, which means that you've got more of that red fruit for character coming through. Um, and then French oak barrels and 12 months aging and bottled and fined and unfiltered. Um, I've got a load of stuff about London clay, but I think I'm not going <laughs> to bother you with that at the moment or fluvial glacial sands. No, yes. um, so, yeah, they were kind of saying that it's back to the kind of it's the soil and it's the climate. Pinot does need, and that's why it's in such a, a narrow band within the world that can um, that can grow really successful Pinot Noir. It needs to be kept cool enough that Pinot's got enough time to develop the phenolic ripeness and, um, and the interest without very quickly becoming jammy and, um, and over the top. And once it gets really alcoholic and really jammy, then it it lose for me, 
it's personal isn't it for me it loses that ethereal kind of beauty mm -hmm. that it would otherwise have if they're made in a much cooler climate yeah what do you get yeah i mean he's going love it <laughs> don't like the price but yes. <laughs> Uh, there's also mention, and I've just double checked it. Absolutely, yes, it is a wine that's sold out as well. So um, we will be getting more back in again, though, won't we? Uh, I'm, because, I'm hoping so. We, we'll have yeah, a, Matthew's a got <laughs> yeah, Matthew. I think Matthew's very much on it with the Danbury mm. Ridge. It's one of his um, ones to watch as well. So um, we will be. I don't know whether it'll be the 2021 vintage that we get back in because they don't produce an awful lot. No, but. Um, the 22, I'm sure we'll be getting back in. And I, I agree. We've got lots of, of notes here, you know, a touch of menthol on the nose, real character, mm. um, stunning wine, very silky texture, great depth. Absolutely. It's it's a really, really high quality, well-made Pinot Noir. And again, much mm. like with Germany, um, we could not be celebrating Pinot Noir without, in the current climate, no pun intended, um, showcasing an English Pinot because it really is um, an, an area of, of English wine industry that's that's blossoming and going from strength mm -hmm. to strength and we're kind of riding a, a huge um, wave there of, of, of quality uh, and Danbury Ridge is very much one of those at the forefront of that as is Crouch Valley as you mentioned that area um, of Essex is is one of those those places to, to seek out and to go mm -hmm. and to plant this an area that that produces very very high quality pinot noir and chardonnay just to uh, yeah in terms of yeah. white wines as well yeah yeah absolutely absolutely it's lovely isn't it mm -hmm. i am sorry that it's sold out because it feels feels a bit mean isn't this a lovely wine that you can't buy it <laughs> <laughs> but then as kevin said do try other other produce other suppliers as well and um how do you get on with um, Wine Searcher? Me? Do you ever use um, that? For... I, I use it from, from time to time, yes. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes that can help you kind of pin it down if you're after something specific yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's lovely. Are you... No, it's, no, it's your turn now, isn't it? So the it next is. one is going to be the Underaga. Absolutely. And and yes, so I mentioned at the beginning that these six wines, we have three from Europe and three from outside. Now we have left Europe. <laughs> uh, you have officially around, left just, Europe. Just, just to get the next pack. There we are. I'm pouring it from, from here. Um, much to my nerves <laughs> doing so. But we have, yes, we're, we're hopped on a plane. We are now in Chile. Let me turn back around. There we are. Um, and we are, as you say, we're looking at Underaga. So a producer um, that produces huge quantities of very, very good wines, very well-made wines in Chile. And they've got a, a lovely um, history to themselves as well. Um, I'm just going to bring up their page whilst I'm talking. Bear with me. And now I'll find the price as well. Ah, well, the price is on this one. Oh, you've done the price. Well, what well, done you? The price is on this. In fact, if I bring the wine up, There we are. Not only is the price on there, but it's it's on a discounted price. Ooh. There we are. So thirteen ninety five a bottle. So we've gone from one extreme at thirty seven pounds with the <laughs> the wine um, before it to um to this here at thirty ninety five. But the quality, it's a very different wine, absolutely. But I think the quality really speaks mm. volumes. Um, for Chile, I'm a huge fan, um, personally of of Chilean wines, across vin across great varieties across the regions. They really do produce consistently high quality wines up and down the the, the country and um, definitely an area that i i seek out and i look for mm -hmm. and, and encourage others to do the same and again a wine that i wanted to show um for the quality and for its its very good value and um, providing they, like the style of course but sub yeah sub 15 pounds as it is now it really is tremendous value um but if i stop sharing there can you see me again mm. Sorry, I was just trying to have a task. <laughs> yeah, so this is a single vineyard, um, a single vineyard Pinot Noir from the Gavitas uh, uh, vineyard, the Gaviotas, um, in San Antonio. So San Antonio is a, um, a, a small wine producing region that really hugs 
the Pacific Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean coastline. Um, it's almost directly um, west of Santiago, the city of Santiago. So we're slightly halfway down the country um, and we're, we're right along. We're only about three miles away from the Pacific Ocean. Um, and those of you familiar with the Pacific Ocean, familiar with the wines um, from the US Pacific West and indeed down into Chile will know that it throws very cool sea breezes across mm -hmm. um, across the um, or through rather the mountain ranges and the gaps in those in those coastal ranges and really acts as a cooling um, agent for vineyards in these areas. So although we are looking at Chile and we are looking at a very warm climate, generally speaking, this particular area of San Antonio and this particular single vineyard, Las Gaviotas, is very cool, um, as I say, only three miles from um, from the Pacific Ocean. So that allows the the season to be far, far longer, a much smaller, uh, sort of slower uh, and longer ripening process. It's the, the great variety of Pinot Noir hates it if it's ripening too quickly. We lose mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. wonderful intensity of fruit and aroma. Um, and so we want this to be wonderfully gradual. Um, and Underaga have found a beautiful spot here. The TH in in um, in their name stands for Terroir Hunter. Really, it's a style of wine. It's a range of wines in a number of different great varieties and producing both red and white wines um, that they seek out sort of the, the best wines to match the climate, the soil and the great variety. Um, so really, they're kind of seeking out or hunting the best terroir for these varietals. Um, the, the producer themselves, Underaga, um, were sort of founded, officially founded in 1885. Um, but in 1879, so six years before that, Francisco Underaga Vicuña started to bring in uh, European cuttings, um, grape cuttings, back into Chile. Um, some uh, Riesling, some Gewürztraminer from Germany, also some Pinot Noir from France. Um, so it's a varietal that's been planted um, by the Underaga group uh, right from the beginning. Uh, in 1879, mm. officially founded in 85. Their first harvest was another six years later in 1891. And they've really gone from strength to strength as a producer. Um, they won, the, uh, they were the first Chilean wine uh, company to export into the US in 1903. Um, they won their very first international award as early as 1910. So only 19 years after their first harvest, they're already winning international awards. Um, and from the 1940s through to the 1960s, they just continued to grow, continued to, to produce quantities of very high quality wines, um, reaching almost half a million bottles by the 1960s. So it's, it's very much a success story from that beginnings in 1880s right the way through. Um, in the final decades of 2000 or the 20th century, rather, the company was bought uh, in 2006. I think it was a millionaire called uh, Jose Jurasek. Um, I may be pronouncing the surname wrong. My apologies uh, if I am. But he uh, bought the, the the estate in 2006 and he went under significant modernization. Um, and TH, this Terroir Hunter range, was one of those innovations that came out of that acquisition from 2006 onwards. Um, and it was a wine that, as I say, really wanted to show, um, to, to highlight Chile um, as, a produce, as, a, as a fine Pinot Noir producing nation. Um, alongside the likes of its Carmeniers and its Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Chardonnay and every other great variety that it can produce so well. Let's not forget Pinot Noir. No, it's, um, I mean, it's amazing that, I mean, I know Chile is notoriously long and skinny, but it's um, <laughs> amazing that they can produce Pinot as well as Cabernet and Carmenere. Um, yeah. It's Richard saying that, and a few people are kind of, and Colin was saying that, um, this one is much bigger, much more assertive. Um, mm -hmm. The German in comparison, Scott, is much finer and has much more acidity and kind of is just a bit more delicate, perhaps. And I would have to say that I would totally agree. And somebody was asking how Alsace compares as well. So mm -hmm. within Europe, my, and tell me what you think, my general thing is that... Um, the English and the French and the Germans are possibly the kind of closest in terms of stylistically. Um, so the French, that. you've still got, well, sorry, Burgundy, you've mm. still got that kind of, um, you've got that slight kind of farmyardiness there coming through as well. Alsace tends to be a bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. Alsace tends to be prettier and more, for me, more fruit forward. So you've got yeah. more of that kind of fresh strawberry, plum kind of cherry fruit and it's more it's just cleaner it hasn't got that kind of earthy quality that you might get 
more with Burgundy, England, and with Germany as well. Mm-hmm. And then once you go into the New World, Chile, you still you've got all of that stuff going on, and but it's just a lot more powerful. Yeah, it's much yeah. it's much bigger wine, isn't it? Than yes, the, and I, the Europeans and I mentioned... are. Yeah, and, and and I mentioned that all right, San Antonio, this area, and there are others, Casablanca, uh, Limarie, Leda. You know, there are other um, sub regions within Chile that are all sort of hugging that coastline that, mm, that produce mm-hmm. very good quality, uh, cool climate varieties like Pinot Noir. Um, but it is still chilly, so it's cooler climate, but there is a huge abundance of sunshine hours and warmth. Um, it does pr- produce then a wine because of that cooling influence, the moderating influence, a wine that does have. Um, finesse does retain some of that wonderful acidity that Pinot Noir is mm. known for, but it very much has more con- you know, concentration and a and a riper fruit profile. Yeah, and I think more more black fruit as well as there's 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 a bit of black fruit as well as red fruits on here, which perhaps with the the English Pinot in particular, I was getting much more of a red uh, red berry yeah, profile. The, the English Pinot was much for me. I mean, they're all beautiful. It's like mm. trying to choose between your children, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. But um, the English has more of the kind of the the violets and the the kind of the the slightly floral, but also the kind of red currant and the the kind of tartar berries. Whereas yeah. this one is lovely, but it's a it's just a richer style. Yeah. And it doesn't um, have that that violets that that floral character. No, but it's, I mean, it's great in its own right. As oh, absolutely. Says, yes. you know, it's very drinkable in its own right. And it would, again, would be great with food. So, you know, each of these pinots, as you start going up, the weight of the Chilean would mean that you could, you know, you could start having that. That would be, it would probably be really nice with barbecued, well, you say barbecued aubergines, mm-hmm. um, kind of, um I was going back to um, barbecued leg of lamb yeah. with all the gnarly bits and then you stuff the garlic and the rosemary yeah. in it as well. I yeah. think that would be perfect. Um, whereas some of the others, the English, I do think would be lovely with food, but I'd actually quite like to drink it on its own as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I digress. And it, <laughs> it, it is why, though, because of the, the, the structure of this wine, as, as you're mentioning, members and enemy yourself, it is a, a bigger wine. There's a lot mm-hmm. more um, of that kind of structure and concentration power, I suppose, behind this and less of that that aromatic profile. Um, part of why we have this was the end of the taste, you know, the, the second half of the tasting. Mm-hmm. Perhaps that'll lead to the way that the next two wines are going to go. Mm-hmm. And the kind of depth and power and concentration. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it it's a wine that shows a different aspect of what Pinot Noir can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, Richard's saying, you know, with climate warming, one gets less than green vintages in Alsace. With climate change and everything that's going on, where certain grape varieties can be grown and where they actually do really well and where they're successful, it's shifting all the time. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that works in um you know how it works in Burgundy, but also how it works in the New World. Um, not the New World, sorry, the Southern Hemisphere, with places like Chile. Mm-hmm. Well, so, yeah. so um, yeah, kind of want to keep an eye on, but I think it's excellent value for many. Yeah, absolutely. Right, is it my turn now? Um, it is your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got wine number five next, which is the Fest Parker. The um, Never entirely sure how to say this. Is it the Star Rita Hills, or can you say Santa Rita Hills, but you just can't write it? Um, I, I say Santa Rita Hills, but um, I might I might get caught up on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so yes, it's the Pinot Twenty Twenty Two, and I'll talk about that in a moment because you probably <laughs> some people are probably thinking what. Um, share the picture so, as well. There we go. Thank you. This is um, from Fess Parker. Um, he purchased the 714 Fox and Canyon, 14 acre Fox and Canyon Ranch in 1988. Um, following his death in 2010, it's now the second and the third generation of um, his family who have stepped in and taken up the reins. Um, Santa Rita Hills is an American viticultural area in Santa Barbara County, which is kind of down towards the bottom um in california 
It was created in 2001, and up until 2006, it was officially named Santa Rita Hills AVA. However, um, Santa Rita, Vina Santa Rita, the great big Chilean producer, had a bit of a fit about the fact that this small AVA in the States was um, taking their name. And um, so they protested and negotiated. And um, Santa Rita, or Santa Rita, Vina Santa Rita, was worried that the, um, that the wine, the AVA, might dilute its international brand value. So um, as a result, it's now um, STA dot um, Rita Hills. So it's a subregion of the larger Santa Nies Valley um, AVA. Um, the wine comes from 54% Ashley's Vineyard, 39% Rio Vista, and 7% Parker West. And I'm sure those of you who know it well are going, oh, yes, <laughs> you can really pick out the Parker West. Um, they're all within the Santa Rita Hills. Um, once picked, it's aged for eight months in 100% French oak, um, of which 20% is new. So you've got that kind of slightly toasty, creamy kind of notes coming through and um we'll talk a little what do you think of it I was going to tell you my fun fact about it but I thought no I'll hold on for that one <laughs> I get I think I, I I think I just like Pinot Noir because every, every one of these um every one of the wines just has a wonderful nose to it and again it's it's got a a spicy smoky character on the nose dark fruits it's mm. quite it's quite um quite broody in some respects you know it's quite muscular smelling if that makes any sense yeah 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 looking forward to trying it what's your fun fact okay so my fun fact is um that best parker wines were exclusively poured at elizabeth taylor's eighth wedding reception <laughs> And at the opening of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, they're extremely proud of this. But I was thinking, the eighth wedding and um, wedding reception, it doesn't really, you know, she's had seven others beforehand. What did she pour for those? So um, it kind of, when I saw it, it just made me laugh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a lovely wine. Yeah. And um, yeah, like Sandra, Sandra's saying, I mean, love, just love Pinot. <laughs> I think that quite a few people probably on hopefully on this call hopefully yes. there's nobody on this call who's just like I really hate Pinot Noir <laughs> why am I having to sit through this um they are it is a lovely wine yeah it's it's more full-bodied I mean it's kind of similar in a way to the um the Chilean but maybe it's just got a little bit less there's it feels like the the acidity feels a little higher it's got more of that perfume as well um those violets um are back with this wine yeah yeah and there's a huge amount of complexity uh, length on here as well i mean i, I you know I, I finished the sip there many seconds ago and i can still very much taste all of on. those different characters uh -huh. and it's got wonderful yeah wonderful length on there yeah and um peter's saying that do try the parker station as well and that is a good um <laughs> a good fruity medium bodied pinot as well it's kind of you're not massively complex or anything but it's just a real pleasure to drink so um it's lovely so with me one second i'm just about to let the dog out come on mommy there you go there you go there um so yeah it's nice to try them side by side as well and especially to then go back and compare them to yeah. to the um European ones. But there's um I do think that the the Chilean does it does really hold its own, doesn't it? Very much. Very much. This one, the the US here, the Fest Parker, forgive me if you did mention the the altitude or how it, but this, no, this I the, the the vineyards are planted with a little, little bit of altitude there, which will add as a bit of a cooling or moderating factor, um, increasing that diurnal. Perhaps that's why that acidity is a little bit more uh, marked or higher and we have those more delicate aromatic characters that you could otherwise lose in warmer climates mm. um tim's saying that he actually prefers the wines of clendenin and linquist and i have to say that um jim clendenin was one of my absolute favorite 
wine producers. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of they're with you, but we haven't we haven't got any ABC wines at the moment. I don't think we have, have we? Um, the anniversary, but not Pinot. Not Pinot, no. Um, so yeah, so hence hence the Shane hence Best Parker. Yes. <laughs> but um, no, they the it's a it's an interesting lineup. Yeah. And we could have, you know, um, we we could have potentially shown an Oregon Pinot. Um, you know, that's another area of the US. They're just just to the north of, of California that's doing great things with Pinot Noir um, in, in various areas there. So this is by no means the, you know, these are the six areas to necessarily go to. South Africa doesn't feature. Oh, yeah. Um, which, which you know, I'm very annoyed with myself. But I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> put it. You know, we don't have Alsace, as you've mentioned already. Um, there are several places. Loire Valley isn't featuring here this evening. No. Um, so this isn't I mean, an exhaustive list of regions to go to. Yeah, there's so many places and so many interesting wines. Um, you could you could do a month on Pinot quite happily. Yeah. Which, right. yeah, sign me up for that one. And I'd I would, yeah. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, for for that wine. No problem. Are you you've got the spoke now, haven't you? I do. Are you going to try and pour it as you go? I'm just pouring it now. There we go. Put that down. One of the most nerve wracking things I've done is pour these wines. <laughs> it worked. Love it. Um, yes. So we finish the final wine um, of our of our six. One of the tasting here. Let me just bring up again. Um, a page. Yeah, so Richard's saying, "Gosh, fourteen and a half percent." This particular, yes, and yeah. yeah, absolutely, yes. We finish with um, suddenly one of the the most concentrating and most powerfully structured, and indeed higher alcohol um, wires. Let me just share. Here we are. So we're hopping on a plane from the US, um, and we're heading over to to New Zealand to finish tonight's um, sort of global trip. Um, by way of Pinot Noir, and we have Spoke, uh, Rudimental Pinot Noir is, is the wine. Spoke is a relatively new um, range of wines produced by Ben Glover. Those of you who might know Ben Glover through Zephyr Wines, his, his family estate, um, and Liam, Liam Stevenson as well, MW. So it's the coming together of these two sort of icons um, of, the, of the wine producing world. Um, and Spoke, they decided, they opted, as we can see here, for Central Otago fruit for their particular Pinot Noir project within um, within Spoke. So let me just stop sharing there because I don't know if anybody has this in their glass. Um, I'm seeing a message that's in agree. So I'm going to quickly look on the chat and see what uh, what we're agreeing there. Oh, I see. Yes, tried them all. My favorite is Danbury Ridge. Well, yeah. <laughs> There we are. I was going to um, do a whoop whoop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still holding out good hope, good hope for this wine, though. I'm still holding out hope. <laughs> um, but really, Spoke is is a um, as a style. Um, it is designed really to to let the let nature do the talking, essentially. Um, it's um, it's a new range of sustainable wines. Um, they like to call themselves actively inactive is one of their taglines. Um, they allow right. nature to speak. You know, they minimal intervention only when it's needed. But really, it's it's for their their wines, their great varieties. In this case, of course, Pinot Noir to do all of the talking. Um, and Pinot Noir is um, one of the most important grape varieties in New Zealand. It's certainly the most important and most planted black grape variety. Um, it's second in total plantings behind Sauvignon Blanc. No surprise there for, for those of us who are familiar with, with, uh, with New Zealand and indeed with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and as a varietal, it's grown across the, uh, across the, the, the country. Um, so we have these wonderful, fresh, elegant, aromatic styles from Marlborough, Martinborough. We have North Canterbury. We have Nelson. But for tonight's tasting, um, we're looking at Central Otago, which is a region that sits at the most sort of southerly end of the South Island in terms of viticulture and wine growing um, and it's potentially I don't know if this is being fact checked but it's certainly one of um, the most southerly wine growing regions in the world um, mm, it, is, that, so. it is right down there at the south and it's a little bit more inland if you have a look at the map and I have a map here I'll try and bring that up to show um, bear with me members while I get this up we can show where we are on the map there we are can you see that um, 
So we can see here that the majority of viticulture and wine regions are hugging this eastern seaboard. Uh, most of the wet weather, most of the rains come in from the west and they're shielded by the southern Alps and um, various mountain ranges and, and are protected in that respect to keep them much drier. But you can see that central Otago just down here in the south, this kind of lime green colour um, is set a little bit more inland, um, but it's almost completely surrounded by the southern Alps. It's almost kind of its own unique microclimate. It's very warm, sunny, um, dry area, high levels of UV. Uh, lots of sunshine hours. So really, in many respects, um, ticks the boxes of what you wouldn't want in uh, for Pinot Noir. All this sunshine to burn, potentially burn the skins, um, all this warmth. But um, the vines are all planted, the vineyards are all at 300 metres and above. So there's a, a huge diurnal range, temperature range there. What I mean is the sunny afternoons uh, are then tempered by very cool evenings. I was akin to putting the grape varieties, uh, you know, putting these different grapes in a fridge overnight before you know after a long day warming up in the vineyard so again it slows the ripening process down um it just it elongates the the the, the growing season and it allows the retention of this beautiful acidity this bright acidity and the aromatic characters that the central otago wines are known for but because of that warmth because of that sunshine these are very con uh, concentrated they're very structured bordering more towards the full body as much as pinot noir does and, and can do so it, it is a wine that is definitely a more um yeah, a more concentrated expression of the grape hence why we have this as the last wine this evening um but a wine that i, I very much enjoy i love it um yeah. for me new zealand it's a bit like alsace it's that they have an ability with pinot noir to make a pinot that's very very clean and very kind mm -hmm. of pure and kind of lovely fruit um this one has got kind of it's on steroids isn't it but it's still it still has that really lovely kind of pure fruit flavor yeah yeah it doesn't have the for me it doesn't have the earthiness that you get elsewhere no you're absolutely right that that purity of fruit i think is a hallmark of new zealand wines as you mm. said mm -hmm. and across all varietals and regions um, and, and it definitely has that in spades, this particular wine. I mentioned how they're actively inactive. So again, a bit like the German wine before that um, the fermentation takes place with natural yeasts. Um, it's also done at, at kind of what the temperatures that nature decides as well. So they don't regulate the temperature, they don't control the fermentation temperatures. It is all naturally done. They only really do jump in if they, if they need to. Mm -hmm. So it, it does speak of its place. And... Um, and a central Otago, if you're if you're a fan of these quite muscular, quite robust, well concentrated, um, and very characterful Pinot Noir, then Central Otago is the place to go, or one of. Do you know where exactly it is? Or I don't just know. I was central trying to Otago. Look. I was trying to find it, I believe, um, and I will try and get the answer to this and put this in a, a, an email through uh, members next week. I will okay. try and find the answer, but I believe it comes from two different vineyard parcels that they've sourced. Um, mm -hmm. Central Otago now is becoming, as you know, such a a sought after area for for wine consumers. Um, you and I alike that we're starting to notice these different, these sort of subtle differences between different sub regions within Central Otago. So you have the likes of Bannockburn and and is it Gibston that's there and and many others at uh, Bendigo you know so they all have their just little subtleties in terms of the different characteristics that they provide um a lot of central Otago mm. pinots will be blends from different areas but we are now finding single vineyard single region sub region expressions so it's it's an exciting area there's a lot of potential a lot of growth in the region uh, for pinot and New Zealand generally it's always been about quality um, first and quantity is a second fiddle and it's all been always been about producing high quality wines regardless so um mm. you, yeah it's it's very difficult to go to go wrong but when it's as good as this it's it's very good yeah it is a lovely wine and the lovely thing about it is i've got six glasses of pinot in front of me and each one of them is completely different yeah <laughs> and i'm enjoying reading all the the messages from the members as well because Everybody is coming up with very different ones that they like as well, which yeah. I think is one of the joys. So there's been a few people saying, um, 
North versus South for New Zealand for a kind of Pinot Noir taste off. Um, and yeah. South Africa, obviously, um, because mm. South Africa produces some of my absolute favorite Pinot Noirs as well. So I think we might have to do a round two. I did. I did think <laughs> I was just just catching up with the chat here, and I did think I I saw something about a part two Pinot. This indeed, Elgin Pinot Noir from South Africa yes, would please. be good in a part two. <laughs> well, um, I don't think I can wait quite as long as another year until it's no. International Pinot Day again. So we may have to do this sometime before then. But, um, I think so. I think so. As long as everybody's up for it, then um, we will we'll definitely put it on again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, sorry, you've, I'm looking at the question and answers. You're bidding me to all of these. Absolutely, you're talking there, north versus south. Um, there was a question that we had coming through. Members, if you do have any questions, please do send, send them our way. But there was a question we had before tonight's event, um, which I don't think we've covered. Or did we cover a little bit at the beginning about clones? No, we haven't really, because we were a little bit. You, you go. <laughs> you go on. <laughs> uh, so it's 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 a very it was a, a, a great question. Um, you know, clones is is something that there are a few great varieties where the likes of mutations or clones are closely associated, and we read about mm. them um, a lot. And Pinot Noir is very much one of those great varieties um, that we do talk about clones and. The question uh, was specifically, do we know the clones of the Pinot for these wines? Mm. Um, what I'll do is I'll start by saying very quickly, no, sadly, we've not been able to, to get uh, the details of which clones are in these glasses. Um, but then I'll also very quickly, uh, because clones uh, could mean many different things, and there might be many members uh, watching this evening who um, are unsure what I mean by clones or what, it's, what is meant by them. Um, so we were discussing a bit earlier is how would you describe what a, what a clone, uh, a great clone is, but essentially I kind of describe it or look at it as siblings, you know, of the same of the same parents. They they have very similar, or well, they have the same kind of genetic makeup in that respect, but just subtle differences, their own unique characteristics, their own unique qualities that make them who they are. Like these clones, individual in the wine context or grape growing context, it could be that one particular uh, clone of Pinot Noir might be um, more disease resistant. Um, another might be um, naturally producing lower yields, so better concentration or more concentration, smaller yields, smaller berries. Perhaps some lean more towards more red berry fruits, others to more blackberry mm. fruits. So that's what we mean by clones. There are just these little subtle differences between them. Um, and producers can decide, depending on where their vineyards are, what type of clone will suit their, their ultimate end game in terms of the wine they're looking to produce or their region and their vineyard better. But essentially you're taking cuttings i think is that right you take mm -hmm. you take cuttings from your preferred clone and you graft that onto rootstocks in your vineyard um to to produce wines that have that more positive attribute that that particular clone has so we don't know what these six wines have but it's a fascinating topic is clones yeah and i think pinot noir just there are about a thousand different pinot clones out there so um it's it's an absolute minefield and its own event in its own right is talking about clones um, but they do all make a subtle difference yeah. they do especially with something which is such a mirror as pinot noir is um with many other grape varieties you can mask that with kind of makeup so oak mm -hmm. and you know the manipulations within the winery whereas with pinot it's one of those great varieties. It it all comes down to where it's grown and what's in the soil and the, the terroir as well, to um, keep using yeah. the French term, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm just looking at the time. One minute to, to a quarter past. Perfect Absolutely. time to finish here, I believe. <laughs> um, uh, Emma, thank you very much. No, thank you, girl. For, for your time. It's been, it's been fantastic to, to talk about Pinot and to taste Pinot with you. Um, absolutely and, and really hoping that everybody's enjoyed themselves and that no matter what you felt was your favorite or if you had one bottle in front of you whether you, you know hopefully you enjoyed that but um yeah hopefully you found something tonight that's um really worked for you and um re re-cemented your love of pinot noir <laughs> absolutely yes uh, and lots, I can see lots of, of comments there about a round two. So we better get uh, get yeah. working on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> members, thank you again. Uh, have a great rest of your Friday evening and enjoy your weekend. 
and you girls as well. Take care. Thank you.